settings. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Nardell. Dr. Nardell was trained in, pul in pulmonary medicine at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital with additional research training at the Boston University School of Medicine. While at the Boston City Hospital, Dr. Nardell became the director of TB control for the city of Boston. In 1981, he became the chief of pulmonary medicine and the director of TB control for the city of Cambridge, a position he held until 2005. His principal academic appointment is an uh, associate professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School with secondary appointment in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard School of Public Health. His research interest includes control of MDRTB in Peru, Russia, and other high burden settings, with a special research interest on airborne TB transmission and control. Dr. Nardell is currently conducting a research project in South Africa studying the transmission of MDRTB using the large number of guinea pigs to quantify the infectiousness of MDRTB patients and the effectiveness of various control interventions, including ultraviolet gemicidical irradiation. Okay, so now I would like to give a floor to Dr. Nardell. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to have a chance to speak to you about my favorite topic in tuberculosis, uh, reducing transmission. With that, um, uh, let, may we see the uh, slides, please. This is a uh, photograph of uh, a typical hospital ward in sub-Saharan Africa. It happens to be the ward where extensive transmission of XDRTB was uh, documented uh, in 2006, reported in 2006 among almost exclusively HIV-infected persons. Uh, this was the famous uh, episode of XDR, extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis, reported by Gandhi. Uh, what's remarkable about the uh, 55 XDR cases that were reported is that most of them had not been previously uh, treated for tuberculosis and yet developed extensively drug-resistant TB, and 67% uh, of them had been previously hospitalized. So the implication here is that TB had been spread throughout this ward, extensively drug-resistant TB had been spread, and that airborne transmission was the result, uh, was the cause of this uh, transmission. Um, let's see, to advance the slide. Not seeing the control for that. Second. There we go. Um, this is one of many examples of uh, occupational risk of tuberculosis. I could have used many different countries. I happen to have chosen a, a country in Eastern Europe, Serbia. And here we see over 12 years, between 1986 and 1997, uh, the risk of developing tuberculosis associated with a chest hospital in Belgrade. And compared to the general population, healthcare workers had a cumulative risk uh, shown here of uh, 3,451 cases per 100,000 compared to 454 in the general population or a, a risk of uh, 7.6. Um, just having a little difficulty finding the uh, change button here. No, it's not there. below the uh, screen somehow. Let me see if I can adjust that. Apologize, I just cannot find the uh, button on my screen. Okay, um, I'll just say next slide. 
Um, so, what are the what are the sources of transmission to healthcare workers and in, and indeed to patients in in uh, hospitals, uh, general hospitals, uh, and uh, TB hospitals? It's very clear that the the greatest risk is from unknown and unsuspected cases. In the case of the XDRTB outbreak that I showed you, uh, the risk was from unsuspected XDRTB. And in many other settings, the risk is from unsuspected tuberculosis, drug resistant or not. Uh, in general hospital settings, clinic waiting rooms, emergency rooms, prisons, it is the unsuspected, untreated case that is the source of most transmission. Next slide, please. In one example in Peru, uh, reported by Willingham in 2001, 250 patients admitted to one female ward were examined carefully for tuberculosis. They had sputum taken, chest x-ray history, and physical examination. And the purpose was to determine what the actual rate of tuberculosis was in the hospital among all patients, not just those who were diagnosed with tuberculosis before it being admitted, or um, th not those just admitted with symptoms and signs of tuberculosis. These were patients who were admitted because of diabetes, or because they were pregnant, or because they broke a leg, or had other uh, problems, and they were all screened for tuberculosis. Next slide. Of um, of those 250 patients, 40 had positive cultures for tuberculosis, that's 16%. Of those 40, 26 were smear positive. 13 were unsuspected. Uh, eight of those which were unsuspected had MDR-TB, of which six uh, of the MDR cases were unsuspected, uh, and three were smear positive. So the point here is that on a general medical uh, board, there were a significant number of unsuspected cases of TB, including unsuspected MDR-TB. So here we have a uh, just a schematic indicating a general medical ward, obstetric ward, psychiatric ward, and the danger of transmission is from the unsuspected case whether it's drug susceptible or drug resistant. Next slide. Uh, moving, um, staying in Eastern uh, Europe, uh, actually in, uh, Sibi in Siberia, uh, our group published uh, a few years ago the cause of MDRTB in the Oblast of Tomsk. Uh, Tomsk is in the in southern Siberia. And like much of Russia, has a very high rates of MDR-TB. And the assumption was that this was due to non-adherence with medication and perhaps that substance abuse, particularly alcohol, was a big factor. A close examination of the sources of um, MDR-TB, however, surprisingly showed that while MDR-TB occurred uh, a rather, rather showed well that substance abuse was not associated with MDRTB, but that MDRTB occurred among adherent drug susceptible patients who had been admitted to the hospital. There was a six-fold greater risk of having MDRTB if you had drug susceptible TB and were admitted to the hospital. So what you see in the low box is that patients were admitted to the hospital with drug susceptible TB were reinfected uh, in the hospital with drug resistant TB and 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 find themselves uh, with a multi drug resistant TB. It, it, I'm sure that many of you can relate to this. What happens in many hospitals is that patients are admitted into the same ward. Uh, you don't find out that someone has MDR TB until they begin to fail therapy, or Perhaps even if you have access to drug susceptibility testing, with conventional testing, those results don't come back 
for weeks or months, and all that time the patient is in the same ward with other patients, coughing, not responding to therapy, and uh, transmitting their infection to other people. Um, you see the picture of uh, Anton Chekhov on the right, who uh, was actually a physician, he was a famous short story writer, and unfortunately also died of TB, happens to be uh, located on the, uh, in the city of uh, Tomsk uh, along the river. Um, next slide. Um, so to go back to our diagram, in addition to having unsuspected TB on the general medical ward, here we show a TB hospital, uh, and most patients have drug susceptible TB, but in amongst them are patients with drug resistant TB, which will not be diagnosed for weeks or months, and who are transmitting that infection to other patients and, of course, to healthcare workers as well. Next slide. We had, uh, it's actually been relatively recently um, that the mechanism of TB transmission was fully understood. It was known to occur in households, and for a while it was thought that it was an inherited disease. And while there are risk factors uh, for tuberculosis that are inherited, uh, clearly the cause of uh, TB transmission is uh, airborne. And here you see two uh, posters from the 1930s focusing on sputum. Don't spit. Um, be careful when you're sweeping in the house because you could stir up dust that might infect the baby shown in the picture. Uh, I show this because it, it um, shows you that in 1930 and thereabout, uh, we really didn't understand the exact mechanism of transmission. Now we know for sure that TB is not spread by sputum per se, and is also not spread by large particles of dust that are swept, that are generated by sweeping, by shaking out sheets, or anything else like that. Well, particles of uh, containing tuberculosis may be in the dust, it's very difficult to generate the, the very tiny aerosols that are required for inhalation deep into the lung to cause tuberculosis. So we don't worry anymore about such things as sweeping. We worry more about person-to-person -person transmission. Proof that TB is due to airborne infection was first uh, uh, reported in the late 1950s, early 1960s by Richard Riley uh, using the famous experiment that is pictured here where patients were located here as shown here in the uh, uh, just pull this arrow down uh, shown here here's a patient room there were five other rooms like this all the air as, as shown in this diagram goes up and into these chambers containing uh, living guinea pigs these are uh, rodent-like animals uh, that are highly susceptible uh, to tuberculosis. So uh, at the time this experiment was done, while it was suspected that TB was airborne, it had not been proven. In this experiment, the only connection between the patients and the rooms and the guinea pigs was the air that they breathed. And uh, as a result, over a period of time, the guinea pigs became infected with tuberculosis, proving that it was an airborne infection. Next slide. So on this slide, we, we have depicted uh, all of the factors re, uh, associated with airborne transmission. We have an infectious patient who's coughing, generating an aerosol shown here. That aerosol goes into the room, contains viable tuberculosis, which is infectious, and other hosts, people who are susceptible, breathing in that air. It goes into the lungs, reaches the deep lung, and causes tuberculosis by way of um, developing disease mostly in the lungs, but of course in other organs as well. I've also shown here various factors. For example, as you'll see, uh, treatment is a very important way to stop transmission. Dilution of the air with by ventilation uh, is another one, potentially using uh, germicidal ultraviolet air, air disinfection. And of course, vaccination has been used as a way to reduce increase resistance to tuberculosis. These are all methods uh, that have been used to try and reduce transmission. Next slide. 
So the, this slide shows uh, some of those interventions. Um, if you go back to that, please. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to see whether my computer buttons will advance this in a second. But at any rate, on this slide, we, we have those interventions. Uh, for example, putting masks on patients. Didn't mention that before. Treatment, isolation between infectious sources and hosts. Um, other means of air disinfection are all, uh, and uh, treatment of latent infection in low burden settings, we tend to try to prevent infection from becoming disease. Oh, my buttons are not working. Please uh, advance the slide. Uh, so traditionally, we, we recognize a TB infection control hierarchy. We uh, have administrative controls, uh, engineering controls, and respiratory protection. Administrative controls are a little bit vague in a way. They're policies and procedures that are in place to reduce transmission. Engineering and environmental controls include the design of buildings, in most cases natural ventilation, but in some parts of the world mechanical ventilation, uh, such interventions as germicidal UV, uh, disinfection, and respiratory protection. And we will be uh, uh, touching on all of those methods. Um, all of these are, are important and necessary, but I'm going to make the case that administrative controls are critical and need to be prioritized, and you'll see why. Next slide. So here's the first question, and I'm going to read it. Um, when do MDR-TB patients become non-infectious on, effect, on effective therapy? And I want to emphasize, and I have put in bold print, or capital letters, effective therapy. Obviously, if treatment is not effective, then it's not treatment. And so the question is, when do they become non-infectious? In less than 24 hours, uh, let me just, uh, in, in uh, two weeks, uh, not until smear or culture negative, and uh, those are the choices. See you all voting. looks like pretty much neck and neck between two weeks, not until smear and culture negative. And most people are suggesting not to uh, smear or culture negative, but I still see some votes coming in, so I'll just wait a second. Okay, most people seem to think not to smear and culture negative, and indeed, that's what most guidelines say, and if anybody else asks you this question, that's probably the right answer, but I'm going to suggest that it's much, much faster than that. Now, why am I saying that? In that same experiment that I showed you from the late 50s, early 60s, in the second two years of those studies, Dr. Riley placed on his ward some patients who had drug-susceptible TB, others who had drug-resistant TB, um, let me just uh, grab the arrow here, uh, some who were untreated for a while and some who immediately started treatment as soon as they came into the ward, and the same with drug-resistant tuberculosis. Now, the most infectious patients were untreated drug-susceptible patients, and 61 of those patients infected 29 guinea pigs. Now, these guinea pigs, uh, let's assume that they represent uh, nurses, doctors, uh, other patients, uh, and that those were the most infectious uh, cases, the untreated drug susceptible ones. As soon as treatment was started, and patients were started on therapy the same day they entered the facility, infectiousness dropped immediately, immediately. Only one guinea pig was infected by 29 patients who were started on therapy the same day they went into the facility a 98% reduction among drug-susceptible patients. There were also drug-resistant cases, and uh, those were, in this study, less, resist less uh, infectious than the drug-susceptible ones. And treatment also had a fairly dramatic and rather rapid effect on transmission. Now, we've repeated this study. I'm not going to show you the data. It's being prepared for a publication right now with all MDR patients and found the same, that as soon as treatment starts, treatment 
uh, transmission uh, is immediately uh, reduced as soon as effective treatment starts. Effective treatment. So on that MDR war that we're working on in uh, South Africa, where we have guinea pigs also in a similar apparatus, uh, and I'll show you that facility, um, MDR patients become non-infectious very quickly. What are the implications for this? Uh, it is a refocus on administrative controls and in uh, the USAID funded project called TB Care that you're sponsoring this program, we um, call this FAST, standing for find TB cases actively by rapid diagnosis, uh, cough surveillance in the case of General Medical Hospital, uh, separate those cases temporarily until uh, effective treatment starts, uh, including cough hygiene and focusing on such environmental controls, and then treat effectively based on a rapid DST. And really here we're referring to gene expert when that is available to you. Not everybody has it available, but when it is available, you'll be able to diagnose drug resistance very quickly, get patients on effective therapy quickly, diagnose drug susceptible TB quickly, get patients on effective therapy quickly. Next slide. So that's depicted here. Here's a gene expert machine. Patient comes in, uh, ha coughing, gets a sputum sent for gene expert. We know immediately that they have TB or within a day, and uh, and whether that TB is drug susceptible or drug resistant, we can then treat that patient in the community without any isolation to speak of, uh, as we've done at Partners in Health in Peru and uh, Africa for many many years. Um, and really reserve hospitalization for patients who have complications. Uh, and on the other hand, if the patient has XDRTB, that is, they have, uh, and, and for that you need other testing like Lyme probase, those patients are not going to respond to uh, drug therapy promptly and need probably to be isolated in the hospital. But drug resistant TB on effective therapy can be uh, managed as an outpatient and drug-resistant TB on effective therapy can be managed as outpatients. So I just want to mention that this is really not new, but we have not actually focused as much as we are now on this timing, the speed with which we get patients on effective therapy, because we now realize that this is the most effective and quickly effective uh, infection control that there is. So in traditional infection control, we have uh, a, a list of uh, activities that are here, developing an infection control plan, uh, a committee, we administrative controls, we environmental controls, and within administrative controls, we place this fast strategy of um, basically focusing on getting um, patients with cough rapidly diagnosed and getting that sputum to a rapid diagnostic uh, laboratory and getting those results back quickly so we can get people on effective therapy. Next slide. Uh, we're going to be implementing this approach in hospitals around the world. One of them is in Zambia, Sub-Saharan Africa, where at every entrance point we'll be looking for coughing patients. All those coughing patients will have sputum taken for um, uh, rapid diagnosis by a gene expert, and those patients will be quickly put on to therapy, in which case we expect to be able to measure decreases in uh, healthcare worker tuberculosis and and uh, I expect that the transmission of other patients will also be de uh, decreased. Next slide. So is hospitalization necessary to treat TB? Absolutely not. In many um, programs around the world, uh, TB is treated in the community um, using community health workers. And as soon as effective treatment, I want to emphasize effective treatment is established, uh, again, based on uh, a DST, um, we know that those patients become rapidly not infectious. Um, this is important because for MDRTB, there really aren't enough hospital beds in the world to, to treat the 500,000 or more uh, MDR cases that are occurring every year. Um, we don't know much about tr uh, preventing TB transmission in the community, but we do know that once people are on effective therapy, 
They're non-infectious, whether in their hospital or in the community, and it's safe to treat them in the community. Next slide. Um, here is just some data from South Africa showing that for all of the uh, provinces in South Africa, there uh, back in 2008, that there were many more patients registered to receive MDR treatment than there were available beds. And for that reason, South Africa is moving toward community-based treatment as well. And uh, I hope are reassured because I've spoken there many times about the fact that patients become non-infectious. Partners in Health has been doing community-based treatment for MDR-TB uh, in, in, in all of its sites uh, in uh, Haiti and Peru and in uh, Russia as well as uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. In Russia, there's still a lot of hospitalization used, but um, day hospitals are also used for treating MDR-TB. Highly effective, less opportunity for transmission. So I'm going to go through the rest of this fairly quickly because we're running out of time. Uh, I want to save time for all the questions that are accumulating. So we're going to talk quickly about the physical environment. Next slide. So just a simple point here uh, illustrated by this cartoon that if you have a large ward, and this is just an ex extreme example, here I have a hundred smiley faces and two of those people have uh, infectious tuberculosis, 98 percent, the 98 others are uh, exposed. However, in smaller facilities, in smaller wards, uh, if I took that same 100 people and divided them into 10 rooms, I've only shown two of them here, only two of them would contain an infectious case and only 18 of the 98 would be exposed. So one way to reduce transmission uh, of unsuspected cases apart from diagnosing and treating them is to not have huge wards or huge waiting rooms and to try and divide people up in separate waiting areas. I know that's easier said than done, but be aware that crowding is a major source of transmission. Next slide. There's some evidence that um, physical environment matters. Here we say see the tuberculin skin test positivity rate of medical students in Lima, Peru, from when they start medical school to year seven when they've been through clinical uh, training. And you'll see that despite BCG, the rates of skin test positivity start out quite low and go up, this is some boosting here, but go up every year, particularly when they get into the clinical years to a, a peak of about, um, I think it's 55% um, have become Oh, it says 45.9% uh, become skin test positive. Next slide. These medical students are assigned to one of two hospitals, and there are two large hospitals in Lima. One of them is called Hospital Waiza, and the other, Hospital Cayetano. And interestingly, the rate of skin test positivity was much greater in the Hospital Cayetano than in the Hospital Waiza among these medical students. Next slide suggests a reason why that may be. Um, in the Hospital Cayetano, there, it's a more modern hospital actually with lower ceilings and more crowded and this hospital is an older fashion hospital with uh, higher ceilings and um, no mechanical ventilation but open windows as you'll see in a moment and these two environments I suggest are probably responsible for the difference in transmission. Next slide. Here we see the picture of the emergency room uh, in Hospital Cayetano, low ceilings, small windows, uh, and here we have Loeza, very high ceilings, and open windows, beds separated far apart, and that is a much better environment for TB. Next slide. Um, hospitals are being renovated around the world. Uh, here you see mid-construction, a new MDRTB hospital in Gaborone, Botswana, and a million dollars was uh, invested in renovating this building. And when we visited it, Paul Jensen and I, uh, we actually asked them to stop construction because what they had done is try to fit as many beds as possible into this uh, previous uh, TB ward that had been naturally ventilated. And it was far too crowded and uh, likely to be a place where TB was, being, was going to be transmitted. So we, we, it was a very poor design. We asked them to stop it and put fewer beds into this ward. Next slide. 
here's a hospital that Partners in Health built in uh, Lesotho, Sub-Saharan Africa in 2007, which uh, has taken into account infection control, control principles. It is a simple ventilation system of just moving air. That ventilation is maintained, a system is maintained. Here we see uh, healthcare workers wearing uh, respirators, in fact, even some non disposable respirators. And you can't see it here, but there's some germicidal UV in use in these wards as well. So, uh, briefly, we do have a course for engineers and architects at Harvard. It's offered every summer. This year will be uh, in August 55 to 11. And I urge you uh, to go back to this slide. Uh, when it's published and if you know engineers and architects in your region who would benefit from this course and also administrators uh, they can apply and we do have some scholarship help for this uh, course. Next slide. So here's an example of a hospital that was designed by an architect and administrator who attended our first course in 2008 and what you see here is a design for a naturally ventilated building. They had previously had planned this hospital without knowing the principles that uh, we teach in this course and then uh, started over again and you see this hospital was designed and within a year, you'll see the next slide, we had uh, this schematic diagram of this hospital naturally ventilated patients waiting outside in Karachi. Uh, Pakistan. Next slide. And this is an actual photograph of the waiting areas outside under a tarp, lots of ventilation. The indoors part of this building also designed for natural ventilation. Next slide. Engineering controls. Uh, uh, we speak in terms of air changes per hour. And one air change per hour removes, if it's well mixed, 63% of all the contamination in the, in the room. Second air change removes 63% of what's left. And third air change removes 63% uh, of what's left. So uh, we need to have in a room, it's recommended, uh, 6 to 12 air changes per hour. Uh, and we accomplish that as in most places through natural ventilation and uh, in other places through mechanical ventilation or equivalent air changes per hour through upper germ cell UV. Next slide. Um, and this slide shows the decrease in risk. Uh, goes down quickly, uh, but then actually becomes harder and harder to uh, reduce the risk um, to nothing. So ventilation is very effective, but it is um, uh, requires a lot of ventilation to local exhaust ventilation is more effective, for example, for coughing patients to put in an enclosure or working at the laboratory bench to have local ventilation. Uh, next slide shows some um, uh, uh, exhaust, uh, rather sputum collection uh, uh, concepts here, a partial enclosure, here a uh, room that's used for sputum collection. Next slide shows a booth uh, used for sputum collection where the patient sits in here for sputum collection and the booth is exhausted the outside or, or the air is filtered. So the next slide is um, I want to ask you how effective room air cleaners are air filtration machines and I'll show you what they are in a moment but if you have any idea what a room um, air cleaner is it's a machine that blows air through a filter or through UV light and I'm asking if they are 20% effective 50% effective or perhaps 80% effective and I'd like your opinion on that We have a, a more even spread. Some people who think they're not very effective at all. Some people think that they are moderately effective, and uh, some who think who they think that they may be uh, fairly effective. Um, generally speaking, um, we next slide. Um, it, it's been our view that um, uh, these types of machines shown here. Uh, that blow air through them and filter the air. There's also some that hang on walls. That these machines are generally not very effective. And the main reason is that they don't generally move enough air. Um, we see machines hanging on walls that you can barely feel any air moving. They're commonly used in Eastern Europe in particular. 
Uh, hospital administrators love them because they uh, can be plugged in and they think that they've solved the infection control program, but mo most with very little air, add very little protection, and we don't recommend them at all. They also require uh, maintenance. So uh, please don't invest in room air cleaners. Next slide. Uh, just illustrating that, uh, and here's another one. This one, the top is removed. You see some ultraviolet lamps in there. Again, not move, moving very much air through this device in terms of room air changes. Next slide. So uh, moving ahead to germicidal UV air disinfection. This is UV in the upper room. And uh, there is direct UV that is, I'll show you in a minute, that is commonly used in Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, and a few other places, China uses it as well. Um, and then there's indirect upper room germicidal UV, commonly used in the US, South Africa, elsewhere. Next slide. And uh, really briefly, uh, UV ultraviolet light in the 254 wavelength is very bactericidal. It's different than UV in sunlight, which uh, tends to be damaging to skin and can cause cancer and cataracts. Um, it, the UV in sunlight is not as effective as for air disinfection, but uh, UV generated by lamps of the germicidal type is quite effective in terms of killing bacteria. Next slide. So direct uh, open tube UV, and I'll show you an example of that, can't be used with people in the room, and that's its major disadvantage. It, it would cause skin and eye irritation. It's very intense. Uh, and is really only good for disinfecting surfaces, but surfaces pose no risk for TB transmission. So we don't recommend upper room germicidal UV. Next slide. Uh, this is an open, open lamp, which uh, we don't recommend. Here we see a homeless shelter in, in Boston, and this is a upper room germicidal UV irradiating upwards, not a low upper room in a very high ceiling. Here's another device generating UV. The air moves in this room generated by body heat, goes up to the upper room, gets disinfected, comes down, uh, and is not infectious. Next, next slide. And here's the concept of, of air moving generated by body heat or by body fan, uh, by a, a paddle fan. And here we put the UV in the upper room and above people's heads. They're not exposed to the UV, but the organisms are. Next slide. So there are many fixtures around the world. I, I show you one with an X through it. Uh, in South Africa that is actually poorly designed because you can see the lamp and people in the room are getting too much radiation. So it is not um, a completely uh, simple technology. You need to have good fixtures, and I'll show you some in a moment, that don't irradiate the people but just irradiate the bugs. So how effective is germicidal UV? That's the next question. Is it not very effective? It's 20%. Is it moderately effective, 50%, or is it highly effective, 80%? Okay, so it, again, a spread of, but most people thought it might be highly effective. And we're going to move along now to the uh, slides. Um, so we, we uh, have another facility like I showed you before from the 50s in South Africa where we can study the transmission of patients on these wards through the guinea pigs in these chambers that are out of sight of the patients but breathe the air from the patients. Here we have three patient rooms and the air from these rooms goes to the guinea pigs. We test them periodically. Next slide uh, shows uh, a, a good uh, ultraviolet lamp in the upper part of the room. And although you can see these lamps, uh, these bulbs here, it's because we're looking directly into it. From the lower room, we would not. This is the ventilation system used to deliver the air from the room to the guinea pigs. And here we see a paddle fan on the ceiling. And this paddle fan in this patient room is used to mix the air to make sure that the air gets from the patients to the upper room and back down again to be breathed. So the paddle fan is to assure 
good air mixing in the room, and somebody already asked about that in the questions, and we'll come back to it. Next slide. So what we do is we turn the UV lamps on every other day, and we send the air when the UV lamps are on to one guinea pig colony. When the UV lamps are off, we send it to the other guinea pig colony. And the difference of infection between these two colonies represents how effective UV is. Or also, we've done the same experiment with masks on patients instead of UV and shown how effective those are. Next slide. And this data uh, shows the number of guinea pig infections uh, when the UV is on versus when it's off, and there was a big difference at the end of the day, showing about 80% efficacy. So those who answered 80% were correct. And uh, this is the equivalent of about adding 18 equivalent air changes to that room, simply by having the well-designed upper room UV on. Next slide. I'm running out of time here. Is it dangerous? Uh, we have a publication you can come back to, but in short, it is not dangerous if it's properly designed. Uh, UV from germicidal lamps, if you look directly into them, can cause skin and eye irritation. But if it is um, properly designed above people head, people's head, it is not dangerous. It's only dangerous for TB organisms in the air. Next slide. Um, so we see that some UV bounces off the uh, ceiling down to the lower room. But in their most circumstances, this is well within the threshold limit value for uh, radiation, and most people have no problem. If the fixtures are poorly designed, like I showed you in South Africa, the UV can be excessive. Next slide. Uh, so in many parts of the world, we don't have good, many consultants who understand UV. We need to train those people. We need to get good fixtures designed and locally available at low cost. Normally these fixtures can be as much as $800 a piece, but there's no reason for that. Uh, if, if they're made locally and well made, they could be much cheaper. I'm not suggesting they exist right now in every part of the world, but we're working on that. Next slide. All right, final uh, couple slides here is, and we'll get to the questions, are respirators and masks. We understand the difference. Respirators are intended for healthcare workers to protect them. You see there's a metal clip here. There are two uh, rubber bands that are holding the mask tight to the face. So there's no gaps here for air to come in around the nose, etc. You're trying to uh, protect the healthcare worker. Surgical masks like this are loosely fitting. There's gaps here where air can come in around the nose. This is to protect the operating field and is sometimes used in infectious patients to protect other patients by stopping large droplets. It's a form of cough hygiene. They're different. Around the world, we see surgical masks, because they're cheaper and more comfortable, being used to protect workers. And they don't do that very well. So two different kinds of face protection. This one intended to protect the worker. This one not intended to protect the worker. So I think we have another, uh, and by the way, uh, these respirators need to be fitted to each person so that they uh, fit properly. So you need to have several models available. One size usually doesn't fit everyone. And there's a, certain, a thing called fit testing that one can um, purchase that will allow you to determine whether the respirator fits properly. Next slide. Last quiz uh, is whether surgical masks on patients are a little bit effective, 20%, moderately effective, 50% are very effective in stopping transmission. Please vote. Uh, we're getting quite a spread here. Predominant see, people seem to think that it is moderately effective in terms of preventing transmission. Next slide, please. So we did the same study with the guinea pigs. Uh, the days the patients wore the surgical mask just around the ears, typical surgical mask. The air went to one guinea pig colony. When they weren't wearing the mask, it went to the other. In our study, the uh, masks were 52% effective. In, in, in terms of preventing transmission, so moderately effective. Next slide. Uh, I would just tell you that 
If you want to continue to discuss infection control online, you can go to ghdonline.org, and we have an infection control com uh, community where many of these questions are discussed, uh, com uh, commonly discussed online. All your questions can be answered there. I think that's the last slide. Okay, so I'm going to go now to the questions which you've been uh, generating. And the first of these, what's the uh, rationale for using a ceiling fan for uh, I I on wards? And the only rationale for doing that is to, well, there's two rationales. One is for comfort, and that's the main reason for uh, paddle fans being used to in, in hot climates to provide a little air movement. And But however, air mixing by itself is not air changes. Uh, in other words, if you have an infectious patient in the room, um, mixing the air essentially uh, dilutes the uh, infection, and, but it also spreads it more evenly uh, throughout the room. So air mixing by itself is not usually considered risk reduction, but it is a redistribution of risk. However, with upper room germicidal UV, a ceiling fan can be highly effective as a part of a UV air mixing system. So in other words, it is part of a strategy with upper room germicidal UV. So what's a good indicator or measure of infection control in a healthcare facility? That is a, a difficult question. Uh, there are two things that are used. One is process indicators. For example, if you can um, show that you're um, doing effective cough surveillance and that the process of getting uh, of identifying cough and getting a sputum to the laboratory, getting those results back, that would be a good indicator of effective administrative controls and that you're separating patients. So there are process indicators that correlate with infection control. Alternatively, um, looking at healthcare worker uh, cases has been uh, suggested as a means of indicating whether or not there is good infection control in the hospital. Many hospitals in Lima, Peru, for example, can tell you how many healthcare workers are infected each year. If uh, you have a lot of healthcare workers infected each year, obviously you don't have good infection control, and that uh, can becomes an indicator that you can use. Is there any specific strategy to ensure TB IC in prison setting, especially for environmental? Well, of course, it depends where your prison is. Uh, natural ventilation is applicable in prisons as well as hospitals, um, mechanical ventilation, germicidal UV as well, but oftentimes uh, these are not uh, available and prisons can be very crowded. Uh, the other thing that can be done and perhaps more important is entrance point screening, particularly in prisons, which I consider longer term incarceration and uh, rapid diagnosis and effective treatment, and that will work in prisons as well as hospitals. Again, difficult to do in jails, uh, which are more chaotic, short-term places, but again, identifying coughing patients, uh, getting them diagnosed, getting them on therapy. Uh, prisons are a tough environment. What is the prevalence of MDR-TB would justify cough checkpoint at a hospital? Um, well, I, so again, difficult question. It doesn't take very much MDR-TB to transmit. So I think if you have um, even one or two percent of your cases MDR-TB, um, you know, you uh, would like to, or, or TB on a general medical ward, you would like to be doing cough surveillance. I mean, I think we should be doing it everywhere. It's a low-cost intervention to identify coughing patients. Uh, in the U.S. where uh, TB is fairly uncommon now. Um, perhaps cough surveillance for TB is not indicated, but most places in the world um, it, where TB is common, uh, it should be done. How can we do sputum collection on a very ill patient on a ward? Uh, again, difficult. Uh, patient's too weak to cough sputum up. It's going to be difficult to get a specimen. Some places do bronchoscopy. Uh, again, uh, not uh, widely available, it shouldn't be necessary. Sputum um, induction can also be done uh, on sick patients, uh, but uh, difficult uh, to do in sick patients. Would you recommend a healthcare worker to use a respirator while making an examination for coughing TB suspects in an unventilated room? Absolutely. Uh, we do recommend uh, respirators, properly 
fitted respirators um, for that purpose. Um, uh, I'm, I just I think I've lost some of the questions here. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, are true? Is it true that EPP is not a standard mask recommended to use in the infection control? I'm not sure what EPP is. I'm sorry. Uh, that's an indicator that uh, I'm not familiar with. Uh, with the information that the main source is through unsuspected case, what is what is the take home message here? Should we screen everybody on the wards? We should look for coughing patients. That's the take home message. In places that have a significant burden of, of tuberculosis, coughing patients should be screened for tuberculosis. So cough officers um, have been used in many settings, outpatient and inpatient. Uh, that only works if you have good uh, laboratory to back you up. Um, what's with the um, these days we find other consultation rooms with AC with closed windows and doors. What is the role of AC and TBIC? A good question. Um, air conditioning uh, with recirculation doesn't do anything uh, about infection control. You feel comfortable, but you're breathing the same air over and over again. So uh, if you have an air conditioned room, you still need to have ventilation or uh, have upper room germicidal UV to provide the air disinfection. Air conditioning by itself doesn't do anything. It moves the air around. Is it true that MDR-TB has low virulence, lower virulence than a drug susceptible TB? Uh, and that is not true, unfortunately. Uh, some strains are less virulent, but many other strains are fully virulent. There are compensatory mutations that occur that restore uh, virulence in many circumstances. Could you share the study of Richard Riley's guinea pigs? Um, I've given you the reference. Perhaps we can post those that paper uh, on the website. I'm not sure how that works, but I'm, I'm happy to provide that to uh, Dr. Golovkov to share with you. How can we define effective chemotherapy? Um, and we're sort of sending letting, letting where full DSTs are not available. Um, again, if you have reason to believe that drug resistance is rare, I think you can be fairly comfortable at starting for drug therapy as effective treatment. Uh, response to therapy clinically, of course, is a good indicator. But if you don't have, if you have a significant amount of drug resistance and you don't have drug susceptible, uh, you don't have drug susceptibility testing. Unfortunately, you really can't be sure the treatment is effective until people begin to respond. And so, what I've said about uh, infectiousness going away uh, almost immediately. Uh, is not applicable. That is only if you are sure that your people are on effective therapy. Otherwise, you really need to um, keep people, uh, consider them uh, infectious for days, if not uh, weeks, until you have clear evidence of response to therapy. How can we say that exposure is? Oh, how can uh, you know, how can we say that exposure is reduced? What method can we use uh, besides using mask? Um, well, um, I've, I think I've gone through the full list of administrative, uh, environmental, and uh, respiratory protection. Those are the uh, methods that are available. Um, there really isn't much else. Uh, doing things like sputum induction outside is a good idea. Um, seeing patients uh, in well-ventilated areas is usually what's available uh, in many parts of the world. Um, so those are the things we can do. Um, what uh, does BCG vaccination provide any protection for adults? Uh, not much protection for adults when given in children, given in childhood. Uh, and there is a little bit of evidence that it may prevent infection, but that's in children, um, but not uh, much for adults. What can you advise if we're a poor country where all new TB cases do not have DST according to cost, we conduct community based treatment? Um, We've been doing community-based treatment in P Peru for a very long time, and um, you know, it seems to be a cost-effective way of doing it. Um, what can you advise for poor country where all new cases don't have to? Oh, we just answered that. Is N95 respirator required uh, during gene expert assay procedure? 
no uh, gene expert except for the initial uh, placing of the sputum into the cup is a very low risk procedure. Uh, for that part of the procedure, handling raw sputum, one should wear a respirator, but beyond that, the rest of the processing does not require, once it's in the machine, it does not require uh, high level respiratory protection. But I would say, yes, you do need it for putting the raw specimen into the machine. And could you share the study again? We, uh, I've given you the reference, but we can um, maybe post that somewhere. Well, I think we're over uh, the hour. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, um, re regarding um, guinea pig study, unfortunately, we cannot uh, send you an article itself uh, because of the um, uh, property rights. Um, we cannot do that. It's, yeah, but what you can do, you can you can uh, you can uh, just find it on the internet. The article, I think it's 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 uh, free now because it's kind of um, articles published many many years ago. Um, That's true. That you can first author yeah. is Richard Riley, yeah. and it no actually it's not the first author. I'm afraid uh, the the most the most recent one is uh, it was actually republished in Environmental uh, Health. Um, if you go to GHD online uh, and sign up for that and ask me, I will um, provide the reference in that form. Yeah. You, yes. We also. I mean, Ed. You also. If you can send us uh, just uh, titles of the of the um, um, uh, uh, publications, we can we can put them uh, attached to your slides and then also disseminate for people registered for your talk. Uh, but we cannot send the entire article. Okay. Okay. okay, so thank you very much, Ed. Um, and this brings our third talk to the end. Um, Dr. Enardellis, for thank you very much for a very informative and interesting webinar and talk. Uh, I would also like to 